Welcome to the new Dawn lesson. I'm beginning on 140 pound watercolor paper. I have my core watercolors out. I have a credit color graphite aquail pencil to kind of do a little light lining sketch to define areas. You could just use an HB pencil. So we're going to come over here and very lightly sketch in the mountain ranges in space that our mass land masses would be taking up. You don't want to do this too dark. You just want to have a sense of where they're going to be. A little sense of what's happening and how the masses are formed. Uh, a lot of this changes as you watercolor, so be relaxed about it. Don't, don't put in such hard lines that you can't change your mind, so to speak, about the outcome. And when you know where that's going, you're wanting just a little bit less then half of your paper to be the mountains, the grass rolling hills, and the river, and everything above is this beautiful sky. Most of the detail in your sky will be focused over here on the right-hand side, but we don't want to forget any of it. Just keep in mind that you have this large, beautiful tree goddess that is situated over here on the left, so she'll be taking up a lot of that space. Now I'm gonna take a big brush. This is just a nice brush for a wash and I'm gonna pre-wet my paper. The trick about pre-wetting the paper is I'm not going to soak it. I'm not gonna turn it into a swimming pool or a hot tub or anything. I'm not gonna make it a habitat for any aquatic creatures. I just want enough water on the paper so that when I do the wet into wet work, it flows and blooms out nicely. If you haven't watched the technique video, I highly recommend you give yourself a few minutes to do that because it will really make all of this just a little bit kind of easier and knowable. Now I'm going to take my watercolor brush here. This is just a round. Um, this particular brush is by an artist named Jasper Stardust. He does these, but the tip of this is an Escoda. <laughs> so it's just a traditional watercolor brush. Um, I like this because it's got a very nice point on it. I'm going to grab my nickel ozo yellow. And here along the mountainside, in quite a wet application, I'm going to brush this across so we have a good glow going. I might stop a little bit on the right-hand side. I'm going to continue to keeping this wet and moving because I don't want... A dry effect, I want a very wet effect. As I come up through here, I'll grab a little more of this yellow. You just want whatever bright yellow that you have. I'm going to lightly brush out in a regular, you can see I go, I go right, I go left, I go right, I go left. I wiggle to the left and then I put a stronger maybe pop in the middle. You don't have to paint all of the paper. You can allow some of the color to blend into other colors. Now I'm gonna grab a quinacridone magenta and come over with a fairly wet brush from the right hand side and let the color kind of bloom and find its way into our shapes here because this is how we get our clouds, right? This is the first layer of how we're gonna get our clouds. The paper really needs to be wet to affect it in such a way that you can do any lifting or anything that you need for the clouds. A lot of times you will get it just in how you paint it out, but sometimes you will need to come in here and kind of force the clouds to happen. That's a little pinker than I meant, so I'm gonna come back with a little bit more of my Ozzo and let these two blend in the paper and become maybe a orange, more in that sunset kind of range. And then as I come up, let's go uh, more quinacridone. Pink, 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 pink. Again, keeping the paper wet and don't worry about painting every inch of the paper. If it has a little bit of less pigment happening, then you're gonna end up with a nice soft bloom. If it's starting to dry, just come back in and wet those edges. 
dry it on me real fast, which will sometimes happen if you're running your heaters. And, you know, I know it's can be cold for some of us right now. So maybe you're running your heater, maybe the air is dry. So don't panic if you have to kind of re-wet as you work. That's not unheard of. Now I'm going to come into my phthalo blue and I'm going to start putting that out. I'm getting great bloom from this. I just work the brush in a nice loose fashion. Where I see it kind of blooming out there, maybe I don't come back into this, but go down below it so that those shapes and that kind of atmospheric effect continue. You can come here. And then we come back up it with just a little bit of pink and where those two kind of merge, maybe you get kind of a gorgeous purple effect because they'll blend on the paper. I'll rinse out. I might come back here with some strong yellow. And you can see I'm sort of making little up down motions that sort of imply clouds, but are not specifically actually clouds. It's just weird how that works. I'm going to add uh, blue here. And you can see it's blooming out quite heavily. If you get too much water, you can always come over to your paper towel and wipe off. And you can take a couple shots at this. Um, if this is, you know, a piece you're super excited about doing and you really need it to come out a very particular way, you know, you can do a couple skies on your watercolor paper and just pick your favorite one. You can go with your favorite one. I'm adding a little bit of pink here. Now right here, I might come through with some crumpled up paper and do some lifting, sort of talk a bit about clouds. You can do that. You want to come in and, and lift a little. You can see that that gives a regular shape. You can also come through with a sponge. Good to do here. I don't want to do this too much because we want this all to continue to do its blending and its resting. I'm going to come get, this happens to be like a Sennelier orange, but, or you can do a, a French vermilion. You just want a bright, warm red. Actually, that's not a Sennelier orange. <laughs> that is a, uh, that is a pyro uh, orange. Silly me. But you get the gist of the colors. You, what you want is a very bright orange in whatever set you're using. I'm going to come here and sort of define and follow perhaps some of this cloud shape that we've got going. You can always soften it underneath. But we're exaggerating it, right? We're getting into it. We exaggerate it. Maybe come along here. Don't take it all the way and work that you've already done. But just play with what will be banks and clouds and elements that are speaking to what's going on in the sky here. You know, let that go there. There's definitely cause to allow a lot of this to rest where it needs to rest. I'm going to come up above the subtractive area that I did just almost to paint the negative space of it. You know, you can always do that. And again, the paper is still wet, so it's still blooming. It's still moving color. It's still softening. Get a little of our yellow. Wonderful yellow, maybe come up underside here. And since this edge is a bit dry, that kind of creates a little harder edge. I don't want to take out every bit of the soft edge that I have here, so I won't. And you don't have to either. And come back with a little bit of the pink and maybe paint a little bit of negative space as it goes there. Even get into the orange. You know, you let some parts pull up into other parts. It's sort of fun. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. 
enjoy creating the sky this is your new dawn this is that new day that you get to enjoy and and participate in that you get to really feel like okay this is happening here you know things are better it's a new year hopefully is just looking up and we're manifesting that that reality in our optimism in our painting in our projecting you can see i just picked an area and and defined it with a little bit of color and then it becomes perhaps something that you you see more of and you notice more of okay okay okay, okay. wiggle 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 up and down finding little cloud forms and little shapes that we can perhaps think about. A lot going on there. Now, I'm gonna also come in and very carefully, I'm gonna wet across the river. I'll go a little over my meandering pencil marks. You can use a traceable, um, repeatedly actually on this project you can use a traceable to get in the land masses and then you can use a traceable to get in the figure um, and you can do them at stages you don't have to use a traceable all at once you can absolutely do them at stages now what's happening here is this sky is going to be reflecting into this water mass that we have going on so we're going to be mirroring it and we're going to start with our bright ozo yellow Going, going, going. And then I might put some here. As I come down, I want to make sure that there is a sense of reflecting in the river what we see up in the sky. Right here. You can always come back through with more yellow. Strengthen any of that color that you want. And that'll pull, you know, some oranges and some different colors in that will also reflect what's going on in the sky. Maybe a little pink, you know, back here at the bend where the river is going to disappear. And we are painting, you know, some of this over with the landmass with the acrylic so it doesn't have to be perfect you'll notice i'm not worried about it being perfect in any way i'm just making sure it comes in some of it's light some of it's darker that is good and then with the glazing and highlights this will become an incredible reflected little wandering stream what you have to do here now is recognize when the piece needs you to let it do its thing. This is that moment when the paper needs to rest and recover. It needs to go dry again. If you hair dry it, you will rush the process and the continuing softening of the color, the continuing blending of the color will be arrested and you won't get to see the fully developed sky or strain that you worked on. So I bid you the self-control and will to walk away from this beautiful piece and uh, not keep fussing past the point it needs fussing. And I know that's very hard, but again, I, I call you to remember that you can do a couple of skies. You can try this a few times. It doesn't have to be one and done. You don't have to apply that pressure. It's just art, it's just fun, it's just play. So allow this to dry completely and naturally on its own. So once you've allowed your paper to have a full recover, <laughs> you can come in and using titanium white acrylic and fluid white acrylic. And, and remember, this can be craft paint. It does not have to be the golden titanium white fluid. You just want something that isn't as thick as a heavy body paint. And again, you can use whatever type of acrylic for these techniques that you have. You don't have to go out and buy a bunch of stuff. It really isn't necessary. I'm going to take my domed blender. I'm going to get it wet and load up a good amount of the titanium white paint. And I'm gonna to start to find banks of clouds 
that I feel are obviously here that kind of came out of the drying and resting of the paper. And you can see the wet application allows this to blend in and almost glaze or tone what's underneath. Um, keep in mind that watercolor lifts, uh, again, even once it's dry, which is very different if you're familiar with acrylic from what acrylic will do. Anywhere that I want to blend it back, I just add more water and just soften the effect. And you can see it just creates almost a glaze. If you've never done this before or played with your acrylic in this way, hopefully it's kind of like a pretty exciting moment to see what it can do when it wants to. And pull some there. Now I feel like I see an opportunity for another little moment right here. So I'm gonna pull that out. You can come back with a bit more acrylic into this and then pick a bit of almost like cloud tops, like cumulus. If ever clouds had been kind of maybe your nemesis, hopefully this is kind of like another way to do that where you're like, hey, that's, that's almost doable. I'm gonna get my brush wet. I'm gonna load it up. Get it fairly loaded. If you see bubbling in your acrylic, um, this is actually called foaming and um, believe it or not, most companies add a lot of anti-foaming agents. It's why I don't recommend doing a lot of additives like soap or glycerins to my acrylic because as it is, they have as much fo anti-foaming agent as they can get in there and it can still foam up quite a lot. It won't hurt for the purposes of what we're doing. It's just important to, to be aware of what it is and why it is. So it doesn't take you by surprise. I find with clouds, it's a good idea to keep irregular shapes, right? You don't want to be predictable. You want to wander around and do things in a way that maybe is unexpected. And you can see how this just... creates another layer. Into the painting. That we can exploit. For our purposes. In the other place, this is wonderful. Is like, I felt like the orange stained a little too heavily down here and it didn't have maybe the soft exposure that I was wanting it to have by coming back with the wash of acrylic, you can see it's real easy for me to soften it. And as you layer it, the layers will build up. So uh, watercolor isn't very opaque for the most part, even the opaque watercolors are not that opaque. Being able to play the opaque nature of the white against the transparent nature of the watercolor allows you to generate some pretty unexpected and surprising moments. And again, if you need to blend, you just come back with a wet brush and soften before dry, and it will blend for you. Layering up the fantasy sky, a new dawn. A new day. Rinse out. Soften, soften, soften. Where necessary. Once that's done, I'm going to put that brush aside and I'm going to grab a detail brush. This is a number one art strip of detail, but what you're looking for is a small pointed brush, something that will give you very fine lines and a lot of control. 
I'm going to load it into my more fluid acrylic and I will come up here to the top. And what I like to do is create a silver lining. I think every cloud should have one. And I just find little spots where I can tell a very particular, I don't know, delicate lace like story, the lace edging of it. It's always exciting to me. If this really helped you see uh, clouds in a different way, um, definitely let me know in a group when you share it. I will be in and out all the time, so it doesn't uh, really matter when you paint the painting. Um, I really try to be there for questions and also not just questions, celebrations. So uh, I'm always here to cheer a win moment in a painter's journey. And if you've got one, I'm happy, happy to cheer that with you. And see, as we pick the silver lining and I don't just come and edge it just one way, right? The little lace edging is, has a lot of different little banks and those little banks, those unexpected banks, I can even come back in an area where maybe I didn't pre-white the cloud, but I can see a bit of a cloud form that unexpectedly maybe journeyed somewhere there. Little moments. And it's different every time we paint it, right? Because the paint rests and recovers a little bit differently. Even if we do the exact same techniques in the same spot, there's not to be Malcolm from Jurassic Park, but you just don't know which side the hand, the water drop will go down, chaos theory and all that. Well, there's a little chaos theory, I think, in our art. A little chaos is good. Chaos leads to opportunity. And uh, sometimes very unexpected opportunities. I'm not suggesting a wholesale chaos like we don't clean our art rooms or anything, but just recognizing that sometimes those little moments of unexpected result in your painting are tremendous opportunities for you to find a, a message or a moment in the painting that's unexpected. Perhaps you're unexpected. You can see I'm just coming along and lining these outside edges. Little bank there is pretty wonderful. I love it. Where we had done the subtractive, you can see that kind of hard edge of the remove paint, and that creates another type of cloud that you can have going on. Find little lacy bits of cloud, lacy laces. Wonderful. You know, finding that little personality in each little bank is quite a lot of fun as well. Hopefully, you can kind of see how I found my little edges here in my little moments and then chose to define those or bring those into focus. I'm gonna come right here and let's come on the other side. A lot of this will be behind our tree goddess. A lot of it, as we mentioned at the beginning, but you can still find little moments so that what's happening on the right side feels like it has some continuity on the left side is what you're trying to create in this magic garden. 
I picked the colors on the sky. These primaries, uh, the magenta, the nickel azo, and the phthalo blue. Because I felt like they created the most optimistic potential dawn. The idea that these are the colors that make all the other colors and the way that they come together creates like the ultimate morning. Um, you can do a lot in your painting where you have deeper meaning in what you're doing and you put things in colors, objects that really symbolize something to you that are meaningful for you. It's something that anybody can participate in. Anybody can take part in. I think that might be behind her. And that's what happens. Like you'll be working, you'll be like, oh, I think that might be, that might be behind her. So I don't want to do too much of that. I like this little moment here that sort of kind of came up on this one where it almost looks like a sun. I think that's pretty, that's pretty darn terrific. Now, we have distant mountains that are snow capped, and then we have green rolling hills. And so for the distant mountains, I'm going to go ahead and grab my number four round here. You just want a brush that gives you control. And I'm going to rinse it out, make sure it has no pigment in it. And I'm going to take a little bit of the purple into my black. All right. I want a gray, but I want it to have a slight cast to it. You want those distant mountains to be a little blue, a little purple, and very, very grayed out. Because what happens is that tells us, tells our brains that they're far, far away. But yet, still dark enough to show our snow cap. So I'm going to come here. My brush is pretty wet, and that way the paint goes in to our paper. Right, I'm not trying to dry brush in any way. I don't want to be fighting the paper. Uh, watercolor paper is so thirsty by design that sometimes it throws acrylic artists off a little bit because they're not used to that thirsty of a surface. But once you realize you can totally thin your paint and not create any binding issues, it's pretty easy after that. So coming forward, I'll go a little darker in my color because this, this little mountain would be closer to me. You could do this with blue, gray, and white, or purple, gray, and white, anything that's kind of cool. There we go, it's finding it, and it's pretty wet, you can see that. So definitely darker. Now the acrylic does not bloom in the same way that the watercolor does because it does not have any additives in it that are designed to make it do so. here and making sure that there's a little interesting value to that and it needs to have a bit of a dry so that I can dry brush over the top so I can layer on there and get some snow caps and while that's drying I can mix in uh, the dark value for my hills so I might use a slightly bigger brush and, and this is just only so that the painting process is a little quicker moves along a little faster I'll just grab this. This is uh, what I call a cat's tongue, actually on the brush. It's a pointed filbert. You could use a filbert. You could use a brown. You could use a bright. It doesn't matter the shape of the brush. You just need something that gives you control for these hills so that you can kind of get those washed in. And that is the green, the dark green, our phthalo green, and our burnt sienna here. Pulling that forward, starting to think about the bank of hills. 
and you can see that the paper does just absorb the pigment. Very similar to watercolor, except it won't lift again and it, and it has a lot more coverage. I like to tap the brush to make sure that there's sort of an uneven embankment the way land tends to be. Painting that all in. And there's layers here, so you're not under pressure. If any of the paper pops back through, you can just paint it right back in. The layers are going to get you through. Multimedia and art is kind of a power move. You know, if you think about it, it is it's kind of a power move. It lets you do quite a lot. Switch mediums when something isn't giving you what you need. You can't combine uh, oils and acrylics and watercolors in this way. That would not work. The oils would interfere. That would be almost a resist. It wouldn't really respond well to the paper. There would be a lot of problems. It is the nature of the water media here that lets it work together. You could also do acrylic, gouache, and watercolor. Pastel, gouache, and watercolor. If you did oil pastels, they would have to be your last layer. And watercolor won't really go on top of the acrylic. So it kind of has to be that first layer. Um, and then to me, I would do gouache before the next layer. And then I would do acrylic. And if I had pastels, I could do it at the first layer, you know. And it's just knowing your mediums. Like, what layer could I apply this to when you're working multimedia? So you could go watercolor, pastel, acrylic. You know, and that would work really well. The pastel might be a little chalky for the acrylic. Uh, the pastel can go over the watercolor and acrylics. There's some layering there. You just want to know that if you're using oil pastels, those would come in later. If you're uh, using media, just be aware of how that media works together. Because there's so much that you can get out of it. I kind of think about the, uh, the embankments that I have. How they relate to each other as this stream flows through. Very magical healing spot. When you put this on the wall, this can be your magical and healing spot. And you look at it, you can touch stone into those feelings of rebirth and transformation. As you do. Getting along here. We'll finish this little embankment out. A lot of this is covered, so if you think that there's her uh, little mound of dirt that she's perched upon overseeing her valley, um, you won't have to be too particular uh, through a portion of this because she's going to be covering it just like she is in the sky. So just be aware that uh, all of this may not be viewable and therefore.
maybe you don't have to be as attentive to it in those spots. So now we have the grain in and we have the distant mountains. And at this point, they've dried enough for their next layer. So I'm going to go ahead and rinse my brush out. And I will take my little angle brush here that I'll be using for grass later. And I'm going to come in and kind of uh, add some snow capped majesty. Now it is okay to take a little bit of your mountain color and put it into the white. So the first layer of snow is not pristinely white. It's actually not a terrible idea. And the paper is still thirsty enough where you can have, uh, you don't have to do opaque thick layers of paint. You can still be doing washes. I'm going to come here and come along the top. Break it up. It's important to realize that mountains tend to have very uneven surfaces. So where you put the snow should reflect that terrain and its randomness. Pretty good. Come over here as well. A little rough mark. So this is so new into spring that there's still some snow. I'm gonna grab some pure white. And touch it to a few places, not everything. You want the two values of the snow to show. Some of that snow would be a little in shadow and some of it would be really bright where you could see it. Tapping the little brush up and down. And just try to make sure that it's rough and you really see what it is. So then you've got your snow back there. And you're still doing so fantastic. And we're going to come forward and we're going to like really brush in um, some of these mountains. I like a scruffy brush. Uh, this particular one is one of my favorite lines of brushes for scruffiness is the Cambridge from the silver brush line. But what it is, is, is it's a hog bristle on a very short cut bright. And the hog is blended with synthetics. Now, one thing I don't like is this company tends to get loose ferrules. Um, you can just glue these back down. Um, but the blend of the hog and the synthetic is quite nice. As I'm coming in, I'm going to start adding a little of the yellow into my green brown mixture. Still needs to be kind of dark because again, building up. I'm going to come here and begin to find moments in our distant little hills. A lighter value. Okay, a lighter moment. And perhaps here, they kind of come back together and see each other. You can have it be uh, still pretty wet at this stage because the paper isn't sealed. So you can be doing the kind of dry brush and washing. That's a uh, an embankment that's maybe going on right here. This is where you can start to shape what's going on. If it's light, you know, it's higher up. And if it's dark and it's, it's further down, come down with some green if you want to create a little rolling hill. 
brush that back yellow where I want to hire Brushing back. This is dry brushing and layering. Where you have the paint thick, it will seal the, pa seal the paper. So if you want it to still be washable, you'll have to do that in glazes. So make sure you're leaving places for shadows and leaving places for highlights on the hills. I need more water. It's real easy for me to get more water in my brush. And blend this into the hill. Sometimes I grab just the pure green so that it's very spring, 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 spring. A little darker green in here. Along the embankment, sometimes you want to go a darker green. And you can see the rough brush stroke also helps it feel like grass a bit, which I like. A little more yellow there. And wherever we're trying to define that sense of a higher hill. All right. You can come along here and highlight some of your hill, perhaps. Little bit of extra there. Playing with it up in the hill. And you can see very quickly that as you add highlights and as shadows happen, mountain and hill shapes start to happen. Come in and get green where I want to soften the transition between those two and speak to a gentler slope. Let that have a little minute and we'll come over and find all of the high and low spots on the other side of the hills coming to us. And hopefully like if you just take a minute to look at this, hopefully you're like, what? Like this is just a pretty landscape in and of itself that you can have in your life. <laughs> in our main mix, it's that phthalo green, burnt sienna and cad yellow. So it's definitely, let's get a little more of a wash on this one. It's definitely green. This hillside, I do, I want a little bit brighter, a little bit more gentling of a slope, 
little bit softer in the transitions. Good sometimes to get maybe right here coming down between this embankment and this one, a bit of a shadow kind of thought about and implied. And the brush is wet er than you would ever do this on canvas. You would do this very differently on canvas. This is a unique thing that you can do on paper. This is a unique kind of effect and look that you can get on paper. Boop, 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 boop. And you've got this. You can totally handle this. Little scruffly, rough strokes. Again, you can always come back with your dark values at the embankments. Make sure that those are shaded, that those areas are defined. A highlight coming down that side of the hill. <laughs> now, if I have too much of a shadow, it takes the indent of the hill too far back. So I can always come in, soften it in with the green like that. Very little differences in the green create quite a lot of effect on what's happening. So I'm going to continue to highlight the space. Find a little moment here along here. Ruffling up. That's the other thing I like about hog brushes is you can be a little, you can be a little irreverent with them. Treat them a little, a little bit rough. And when you have that kind of general roughness in, well, we're going to come in and we're going to kind of maybe get some little highlights in there. I want to make sure my brush is sort of together. And so to do that, it's the yellow and the green. And this time we're going to get a little bit of our white involved in it. So we have a bit of a brighter color. So I'm going to touch and tap and let it be kind of rough. I have, the brush is pretty perpendicular. Perpendicular is, you know, pretty parallel to the paper. And I just touch little highlights. You know, sometimes you can get a little more yellow into it. I kind of like the sunlight. I like to think of this as like the sunlight coming down and kind of hitting the height of the little areas here, picking them up, bringing them forward into our mind. Mm 
dashing my little brush around trying to much like clouds you know keeping it uneven you can always go yellow and green And again, we'll focus along this right side. Focusing it out, making sure we can really see it. If you want to go yellow green, you can do that as well. that back when you kind of push that back in that rough way it creates a very rough sense of grass sort of fun and again keep in mind you've got a very large tree goddess that's going to be right here You have space. Get a little of the yellow. See where we can place it. Sunlight. That's what the yellow is. It's the kiss of sunlight. Coming together, guys. You just sort of take that in, and when it's where you want it, you know, it's perfect. Things to be mindful of. Give yourself several shades of green. Grass is actually quite colorful. It is uh, never like a uniform green. Remember that you've got a nice, pretty large embankment with grass right here. So, you know, don't give the best of your details to the area you're going to be painting over. Um, find, make sure you keep those little places close to the water, some embankments dark there, so it really feels like it's coming at a steep angle and is blocking the light in the stream. Um, try not to overwork your white highlights, you know, keep that light. Um, allow this to completely dry, and then we will chalk in our tree goddess. After you've allowed everything to completely dry and really settle, you can then put in your forward hill in the foreground and your goddess tree. Now you can do two things to get this on your surface. You can uh, look at the reference and create your version of the goddess tree um, on your surface. I will say that I like to use a combo of a white chalk pencil and a brown watercolor pencil. And the reason for that is is that in the areas where this is uh, very light, the white doesn't really show up, but the brown does. And then in the areas where it's dark, the brown doesn't show up, but the white does. So it's nice to use a combo. You could also use serral paper. Um, and if you check your PDF, there's some information on this and how to use a traceable. And those things are really okay. And I really can't press upon you in doing artwork that uh, your techniques or your procedures don't weigh into the merit of the final result of the work. And what I mean is, is that tracing isn't cheating. Um, projection, transfer, these are really old art techniques. They teach them in art school. Uh, if you followed me any amount of time, you've heard me state this before, kind of emphatically. But the point is, is at this stage, you want to kind of get this up here. I put the hill about three fingers up and then about three fingers from the end. So there's a bit of balance. I do lose a little bit of my water. You can make the hill higher, you can make the hill lower. I mean, there's really a lot of places that you can take this um, that works out really, really fine. And then the next thing is I like to put in the tree first 
um, get her kind of settled in and then kind of get in some grass and then add some leaves. So when we paint this in, um, it's really about creating some dark value and middle ground values and light values. I'm going to begin putting her in by mixing a little of my burnt sienna, move my water closer, with my black. Um, and just to go over this, just in case it isn't in the forefront, uh, burnt sienna, thalo green, titanium white, doxazine purple, thalo blue, cad red, cad yellow, and quinacridone magenta. And if you remember in the technique video, you can also just use a pre-mixed purple, like a good purple or a good um, pink magenta, if color mixing is not your favorite. And my point is, is that the flowers can be whatever color you want <laughs> and should be because we're, we're celebrating getting through a year. Now, when I come through here, I'm going to kind of speak a little bit to the twists and turns of our goddess tree. And I think it's important to note, you know, that as we go, the way uh, her body twists and is formed in the tree, when you look at trees, you will actually sometimes see figures in them, especially once you've done a couple of these little like tree goddess projects, you'll see trees in your trees. I mean, people in your trees. And so it's kind of a fun thing to play with. I liked to take the twist of this in such a way that it really pulled into the thought of, of who she was as a tree. I really thought about her treeness. And I did try to form, you know, uh, major structural objects such as legs and a face, even within the twists of the bark, so that she would feel alive in real and that there was a lot of gesture and form with her um give a nice little hip mark there and then another little one here i love how this the legs kind of intertwine it's a really enjoyable part of this particular piece for me and even as you're doing these little twist markings if you don't like one you can change it uh, as you paint it's easy enough to do so what you might like, if you're loving your garden, you might be like, oh, I don't know. I'm no, I'm no, I'm ready for, you know, what's happening here. But remember, especially at the part where you're in the acrylic painting, it's really easy to change direction and change your mind. And bring some little roots down. I like to bend some over the back uh, uh, to help her feel very seated on the hill that she's on. Like she wouldn't be just blown away by a gust. Um, certainly when trying to paint, you know, a better, more optimistic feeling for this new year, I felt like resiliency was an important thing to represent in in her in this image so that when I looked at it, I didn't get the sense of her being precariously balanced because that wouldn't help me feel relaxed in any way. Now I'm going to come to what is, you know, her elbow and add a little offshoot of branches. Kind of fun to do. And I will perhaps twist structures up her arm a bit when we get to our hands what's wonderful about this is if you've not been a fan of painting hands in the past they don't need to be hands <laughs> that's what i really love about it um they are branches so they don't have to have that built structure the way that you do when you're trying to create a hand that feels like a hand i will do things that give the appearance of being hand-like, but we've got, you know, leaves and things coming down that will hang on the structure. So as long as I imply that there are these finger-like branches coming off, the end result will be terrific. I 
The only thing that's kind of like sometimes frustrating is that you know you've got leaves coming down over your gorgeous clouds and you're like, oh, to lose that beauty, you know. So you can choose to do your leaves around them if it's, you know, super, super critical. I think it's also nice to have little bits of branches that come out of her maybe in places that you wouldn't expect uh, but would make sense for her. Uh, if you guys were a fan of Groot from Guardians of the Galaxy, you could certainly paint him right here <laughs> if he was your feeling of resiliency and well-being. And again, I like to make sure that I have little bits of tree branch coming off her elbow. I just, I just feel like it, it adds to the authenticity of her tree. And bring here and kind of flow that line around. And you'll notice that I try to flow in the direction of things. So even as the branch is being formed, it feels the way we would expect wood or a, you know, structure like wood, a st structure like wood, that it flows that way. And, you know, it's really easy to get kind of in that meditative sense of things. And you can see, like, here's what would be your thumb, but I'm just taking out a branch. So, you know, keep in mind, you are just painting branches and you don't have to be hard on yourself at all in what is the hand space. Maybe she's one of the tree wives from the Ents and Lord of the Rings. Hard to say. Now on her face, I'm going to come here, come do an indent. Bring in the half shadow of the face. So this part of her face will be a little bit more in shadow. The lip. And it come down underneath. So already we start to hint at some of that. Now we're going to change and adjust it as we're painting her in, but it's just nice to have the forerunner of that. I will bring a shadow up here, even as I bring branches out. It can help on the thirstier part of the paper to add a little more water to your paint, just to help it improve its flow. Lots of little branches that will be kind of coming off of her head and weaving here. These will really go right into some leaves and do some things that also inform that they are branches, but it's nice. You can even give yourself a little guiding line. Make sure you've got a little crown of them. They are support structures. And you don't know, maybe she's like, I got such thick, gorgeous branch hair. She probably is very proud of her thick, gorgeous branch hair. My thing is just making sure that there's a sort of smooth, we're growing out of her head feeling. You know, and I have a lot of highlights that will come up into that. It just gives me a chance to get that in. Now I might use a bigger brush on the ground and I definitely am gonna wanna use a dark color here one because I've gotta paint out what's here. If you want to move some of your hill, so that some area of your water might still be showing, that is completely doable. And I'm gonna do that because I like that little passage right there. And that's one of those artistic choices that when you're painting along, even on a tutorial, you can make because you can have a moment in your painting that I didn't have. And it's perfectly okay for you to go, you know, this magic thing happened right here. And I appreciate that you painted over that area, but for me, that was like my moment in my painting. 
and I don't want to paint over it. And that is always going to be okay. I do highly recommend checking out the extra uh, resources as I design those to help and fill in any gaps that you might have or need or and I, I think people just learn not all one way you know, everybody has a different kind of learning process or style so while the spoken word or the video might be helpful maybe you're a person that needs to read it and digest it and that is okay so this is just you can see I'm just putting in the hill I moved it down a little bit just because I want to keep some of this and I may even be a little careful with my flowers and things now, while this is here and having um, a bit of a rest, like it do. <laughs> so while this is having a dry, I can put in the watercolor shadow that I have in my glaze. And I'm going to grab just my little round here and uh, my phthalo blue. And I'm going to come along the embankment under the acrylic. And I'm going to bring out a little kind of bit of shadow that gets cast even into the distance in the water and that's a thing that does happen like where the embankment is there's overhangs there's all kinds of things and they will create a reflective shadow if you pull a little bit out here you play with that when you do your painting even though this is a fantasy scene there will be elements of it that feel natural and familiar and you want things to feel natural and familiar or maybe don't which is also okay how are you guys doing are you feeling okay i hope so keep painting don't forget to breathe don't let any part of this become you know a deep worry or concern it's just a painting just a painting and it's one of many this year there's so many you're gonna do and you're gonna get so much try to think of this year as the as i mentioned earlier the sum of total parts right it's not just each project it is cumulatively what happens between you and all the projects that you have i am being a little careful and precious and you can see I'm just glazing over with a little bit of my halo and maybe a little more of it comes along the embankment. And you can see right away that creates that sense of that being even more perhaps realistic. Come right here. Bring out a little point of like shadow and Come back. Nice. Kind of thought out. I'm going to bring the trick about these is try to keep them as level as you can. You know, realize that everything, every mark has meaning. <laughs> Not to go and put pressure on you when I just told you don't, don't pressure on yourself but marks do have meaning and you want to think about how the mark is adding to the piece is it is it telling the viewer something important is it creating a sense of balance somewhere where maybe it was needed you know that's just something to think about and then you know right after that you know you can come in and I know I've got some white fluid I'll be putting out later, but I'll put out my white fluid paint now just to make my reflections easy. And I'm going to take an angle brush. This is a quarter inch angle brush. I just want a brush that gives me a good sharp edge. We might have a favorite detail round that does it for you. And that's also okay. And I'm going to come here. And this is just white acrylic. Add some little reflections. Uh, they can represent areas of rough water or just where the light hits as it comes down the valley.
just like you put the shadows in, they tell you something about the stream, the speed of the water. If it's stagnant or not. Which, you know, the way we painted this implies that this was probably, you know, old school. <laughs> in this fantasy world, water that you could drink straight from a stream back when you could do that. so weird in the world to have lived long enough where there was a time you could drink from a stream pretty safely to now being in a time where I wouldn't even consider doing that. You know, a time when I would drink from a hose, but now I, I wouldn't. Not without having some real assurities. about the quality of the water so you can see when we get that in that adds that next really amazing layer about that body of water it let everything kind of find its dry here so i can go back into my um acrylic you know it's a good time to check your body posture these painting sessions can be long my painting sessions tend to be a little bit longer and that's just because we're doing a lot in in that painting session but you can totally do this just because there's a lot of layers and it takes a second doesn't mean you can't do it. Even as a beginner, this is a very mixed class. This allows a very mixed level of skills. So you should feel absolutely ready to, to be here and do these things because they're super doable. You've got this. So my next thing is I start to paint in some of the pure sienna. And I'm going to take a little of my yellow and red and kind of work them in because I find that uh, siennas in paint companies are very different. They are not um, the same across several different companies. And so you will find that some siennas will be more to the red and some will be more to the brown and that you will be making decisions each time to really look at that brown. Not as what the label is telling you, right? But what the brush in your eye is confirming. And so if you're like, oh, I, you know, that's a little darker brown than I would want in this space, lighten it up. I'm just going to paint inside these little areas. Starting to... Build out the solidity of her bark. And there's really nothing to do but just paint that in. And we don't really do anything different than that until we get to her fingers and her hair and those objects. And the nice thing about using chalk and a watercolor pencil is that I can easily remove those when everything is dry with just a little bit of damp water. Again, as I get up into the area that hasn't been, see down here where the acrylic is, the paper has been very sealed. So now it's taking paint relatively smoothly. Up in the sky, which were just watercolor washes, it isn't sealed. So it's like painting these hills and Therefore, having a little more water on your brush will help you get a better result. You've got this. You can do this. And we can come back and put back shadows. So again, it's I'm lightening things up. Now I'm not going to do any of my like extra, too much extra, too far. I might bring some of this up. Maybe bring some of the brown out. 
through here so that some of those branches have that tie in. Now I found with the face that I, I made several adjustments to her face and I'm prepared to do that again here. We're just creating those first planes. And then I'll show you how we kind of define the face in. It's also nice to take her bark skin color, I guess that's what we're gonna call it, her bark skin color up into the branches that are coming out from her head. We'll come back with a detail brush in a little bit, but this continuity, We'll make sure that in her head, it feels that they're growing out organically. And you'll want that. You put a little bit of that there and come down the neck. And again, if it's thirsty, add more water. You can take any of that color up here and pull it into the. And merging the, and marrying those colors in together will um, help her feel more authentic. Her little branchy, twisty arms which I personally just think are wonderful. And we have to remember that there's going to be so many leaves hanging down. You don't want to put a whole bunch into everything if you're going to be painting it out. If that's going to bother you, if it's not going to bother you, you paint everything through. And the reason you might do that is to keep working on the techniques. You're like, you can be like, oh, well, I'm just working on these techniques. So when she's in that far, I'm going to come up here and I'm going to mix some great amount of orange. That way I can bring that into my brown. and lighten these colors and warm them up a bit. So here, I might begin to refine some of the twists around her. The layers do make a difference. I can come back and put in dark value. But no point do I get into my canvas and go, oh no, it's ruined now. You know, and you don't have to either because you've got a hair dryer and you can dry everything. I know it's a lot of the same, same as we layer up, but we're, we're making bark skin. And that like regular skin might take a couple layers and we can handle that. I mean, you probably started being creative to get to play with all the art materials. So play with them. Enjoy them. If a technique takes a minute to master, don't lament over it. Don't worry. Just be like, woohoo, more time with my stuff. Bring a little of that down here. You can see that we kind of play with the way the twists bring her body around.
wherever you want to increase the twist or lessen the twist, just do that. Maybe I come around here on the forehead, on the nose a bit. Now pull that up into the branches along your face. Pull that up into the branches along your face. Enjoy that. All right. Now, while she's having a dry, right? She's having a dry. It's a little bit like you having a spa day. We're going to take a little bit of our green and brown, and you can use an angle brush. You can use a round brush. You can use a grass comb. It's all fine. But what we want to do is create little upward marks. Now this is that first kind of dark grass color that we will get. Where you want the hill or some design elements to remain, just don't paint grass over. And so if you're like, oh, right here, I would very much like it to be quite a lot of that little stream to show. Then move the top line of the grass down. You can always bring it up from the bottom here. You can, you can, you can, and you won't have any problems. There you go. Just painting a little grass should be a little relaxing. You might do just a couple here a little bit longer. So when you come in and put the flowers, you're all right. You can see that that starts to inform the texture and directionality. When that is good, maybe grab a detail brush. I'm going to get some of my very light orange. Okay, to put some brown into it. Maybe I'll come over the brow. like to uh, have a little highlight there and pull a little bit of it right here. We'll have to put some shadow back there to kind of uh, help the shape of her face. A little here at the chin. And then if you need to blend anything, you just kind of come back with like a damp brush and just Soften any of this out. I like to come back uh, with dark. And I'm just going to play the dark against these lights. So I have my little nose here. And then I want to make sure that I've got my nice top lip. Just make sure whatever you've got going on in the eyes is reflected and balanced on both sides. That's the big thing. Reflected and balanced on both sides. I can go more yellow. 
into my orange. Highlight up the nose a bit. A little bit down the jawbone. A little cheekbone there. Now as I'm going, I might mix some of my orange into my brown. And let's just make sure that we pull some of this up into the little branches that are being humming off of her little head. There we go. We're doing great. I can always go more into the brown. And just blend some of that in. And you've been doing faces. You're going to be doing faces. So don't let this be like a, a stopping point for you. Now I like to add a little white to my highlighty bark color. And I'm going to add a bit of that to her nose and a bit of that to the center of her lip. play with it. I do like her to have a face that looks relaxed and not super duper concerned. And you know, that's really just about you know, wanting to make sure that she helps me feel relaxed, not anxious. <laughs> and this little bit of fussy time that you've taken will have allowed a lot of this to dry. Any place you need more color and you can come. Get into a lighter color here. Try not to take out, you know, all the value of the colors that you previously put down, even as you're putting these down. You want to see what you've got. underneath. Bringing that down over the tops of things. A little bit of highlighting into the finger branches. I think thoughtful highlighting around the twists on the neck and up into the branch. And thoughtful means that, like, you know, sometimes you can just kind of throw things down where they are, but other times you've got to be like, oh no, I need to really think about where this is. So I try to tell you guys like, oh, this is an area you can be super relaxed or, oh no, it's a time to meerkat up and pay attention. Meerkat is a very attentive, alert little animal if you've never heard of them, but I mean, meerkat manner. 
early watched it. If you haven't, it's a good thing to watch. Well, doing pretty good there. And now you go through and you can come back with, say, some of your darker brown. Start to give some of these spots shading when they're necessary. It's all about layers. Yeah, maybe I want to like kind of move that down a little bit so that it connects a bit stronger into her body. You know, and let's get some black and some brown. Add some water to it so the flow is good. And let's kind of redefine some of the little twists. Sometimes as you're painting, you will have noticed that, you know, you added twists or removed twists. If you like what you've got, lean into it. If you don't, just change it. Don't be anxious. Nice long brush strokes pulling up. And again, we're no, you know, we've still got a highlight and the adjustments we want to make, we can make during that time. I'm just looking for spots that need more definition or a shadow for them to really show and be defined on the piece. I'm looking for that. And we haven't even put our highlight highlights in there. And if I may, don't be hard on your tree. Don't be hard on your tree goddess. You know, who's to say the shape of your tree goddess isn't her perfect ideal shape? And we shouldn't, uh, I think we shouldn't body shame her. <laughs> so, you know, there's a reason why. You're painting like you are right now. There are shapes or things or, or values that are speaking to you and you don't want to not honor that. Sometimes it's nice to put a little bunch of twiggly bits coming off the back here. Like little stray hairs. And then even right here. When you have her there 
it's mm-hmm. time to add like the last little pop of highlight, which I will take my very light orange and some brown. And this time, yellow and white. This is almost an oak. Doesn't have to be everything. We just exaggerate the things that we want to pay closer attention to or push the shape and form on. Now I'm looking at her and I'm feeling like I want a bit of a branch off of her hip. So once I get this in, I may go ahead, now that I have her all kind of worked out, and see if I can't find a space for that to be a great idea. A nice little twist of the of her there. So I'll come off, I'll come into my black and brown again. My dark value. And I may come up the hip. More water, because it's the thirsty part of the canvas, right? A little bit of a of a twig thought there that continues that on. You can always come back with any of your but it just helps her continue that feeling of being a drink. We're doing so good. So now we have grass and flowers and leaves. So hopefully take a minute to rest and restore. Remember to be present to how you're feeling during your painting, not just emotionally, but also physically, because when we paint, it puts us almost into a meditative state state, and we lose track of hunger and time and our physical wants and needs. And our body always deserves a little bit of care, so it's important to be attentive to those things. I am going to put some willowing drops of leaves that come down around her. And it can help to kind of think about a couple of things. One trick that I may do to make sure that they feel like they're coming down somewhat vertically is to give myself some guidelines for some of the more focal little drops of flowers. They don't all have to be this way and they could be blowing in the breeze, but um, it's real easy to, you know, have these kind of go off, off that way. And then if you just, just a little chalk line and then you don't have to worry about it. Now I'm going to start out, you could start out with a filbert or cat's tongue. Really doesn't matter if there's the archer or cat's tongue, but just a filbert will work. You just want a brush that's going to give you a particular kind of brush stroke. And I'm going to take a little of my green. Make that dark green value that we like so much. And I'm thinning it because we're going to be up in that thirsty area of the surface. Now I'll use a very small brush low. I'm going to be building up the larger areas of my leaves. And the brush stroke is that little pull 
If you need a kind of refresher on this, don't worry. We have that in the technique video to help you. Now again, I've got a bit of a one coming down here. So I know I'll be putting smaller leaves in, but if I put this in as a guide, it will absolutely help me. when I'm putting in other leaves that I want to be a little focused about. I'm going to paint in, I'm gonna move this where I have better access to it. Get things out of my way that might be in my way. Make myself comfortable. and start to build up the main canopy. And you can see what I mean about like on the fingers, you don't have to worry about that too much because they very quickly will become branches. And we remember up in the sky is thirsty. We have this now to help us guide down a couple little trailing branches. So we're okay there. Even as you go bigger on your brush strokes, still keep doing them because that implied texture really helps. You'll come back with tinier brushes with your number four round or detail and uh, really, really, you know, change this up, but it's important. To get the structure. Now there's a bit of this that builds on that. So I'll go ahead and hit that in exaggeration. And there's a bit of this. I have peaks of light that happen all down through here, but not a lot in the rest of the canopy. So we just paint this all in. That helps seal the paper and also gives us lots and lots of uh, structure and construct to build up from with our detail brush. Now, for convenience for myself, I'm going to move a little bit of my yellow over here closer so that as I am building up the leaves, it's, it's just easier on me and I may put out a little more green. I've got plenty of brown here and plenty of white, so it's just about making sure that I'm really just comfortable and that I have the things that I need. I'm going to get another round brush and get it wet. And I'm going to, coming from the left or the right, so I don't drag my hand through tons and tons of wet paint, begin to add the details of the lighter leaves. You can see I bring this right into my already mixed green. And that's going to let me have room to lighten. I am rolling the extra paint out of my brush. And you will probably be dipping in water pretty often. Make sure you're not dragging any, any paint through. Build that one out over towards the side there, maybe underneath the hand. You can weave um, elements of this in and out as you see fit.
where I have bigger leaves, I just touch the brush larger. Varying the color is a huge deal. Also varying the size of the leaves through your tree. A huge, huge deal. In as much as anything in art is a huge deal, to be really honest. If you get any paint on your hand where you don't want it, be sure to get it off. Like I'm a, I tend to be a little heavy handed and it's okay to make sure that that's not there. Uh, the reason I say this is acrylic tends to stick to acrylic. So if you have dry acrylic paint on your hand and you touch even a dry spot on your surface with it, it will transfer. There's some CSI info for you there. Now it can be nice to like to add little bits of greenery that's sort of coming in and out of these branches. It, it just reminds me a little bit of like he's got a, I don't want to say bangs, but that there are elements of her Greenery. I just tend to be a little playful with that. Play with these. You can see I'm just building up the layers of dark and light. I need to get some more water on there and even some more yellow on there. I can. Let's drop some down, say. We know we had this drop here. And that will help make sure that the other drops that are coming down this way don't end up blowing in the breeze too much. Just being playful with the branches. Adding more water where I know I'm going to be over thirsty, thirsty territory.
building up the green. In this, the layers of leaves really, really create a sense of depth. I don't generally um, paint trees leaf by leaf. But for this particular piece, I think it's of benefit. especially where we're creating a sense of spring health and rebirth and vitality. Now, as I go, I'm going to add quite a lot more yellow to my, to my green. And then we start to Speak to these delicate little highlights. And this is where I can start building um, shape in the tree. You know, you can have kind of areas that are maybe defined as a forward branch because the highlights come forward. And we can just work these through. Just relax. Putting in the leaves. The leaves. The many, many leaves. You can see where I want smaller leaves. I touch the brush a little lighter to the surface and that creates a smaller mark. And then where I want it to be bigger, I kind of touch and pull a bigger area. And that really does. And as you might expect, areas that get more out into the sunlight might be brighter, might have more light greenery on it. Don't paint out all the shadow of your tree. That is truly what gives it depth. So everything can't be in highlight. It's really nice to let the greens blend on the canvas together.
And then you can always come in with a little bit of the phthalo and kind of make sure that these weave well. What I mean weave is that there's a there's not a hard stop and start to a particular value or green that holds your eye too much and therefore takes away the illusion of what you've been trying to build here. So it's just good to pay attention to that. Now I can let that dry for a minute and I have to do some similar stuff down here in the grass and letting that dry for just a second. Um, not totally dry, but dry enough to take a very light layer. I can come back in with some grass colors. So I'm going to put some more of my green in there, put some yellow. And the next layer of slightly brighter, but still deep grass, still deep. little deep grass it's okay to bring some blades over her roots because that's what's going to make them feel you know like they're here and these are those first marks they create that pattern they create that texture it's with the highlights and shadows that you get that real sense of the way the grass is blowing and and then the flowers that are in there because we're gonna be putting flowers Let's keep getting that wet. It's coming through here. And that should have given the top just a half second to sort of stabilize and I'm going to rinse out. And so for this part, I'm going to just really get into my yellow that already has green kind of in it. So we get this yellow green, but I may even come in and add a little of that white. And let's come here. Add little bits of highlighted leaves. Water if I need to, just to improve flow, rolling the brush to improve the load. Now I'm going to layer a forward bit of leaves right here and you can see I just did that with value just creating space and light. I've also got flowers that will be helping to find this space. So that is going to actually be of great use. You can see what I mean. It's not completely dry, just a lot drier.
bringing it up this little last one. Now, before we put the flowers in, we do need to let things dry. That just gives us a great opportunity to work on our grass. There we go. We've got that upper canopy kind of beautifully designed. And you can keep going at this, making this more full, less full. It's really up to you and your preference. But while we're here, I'm going to get some of our yellow and green and create a highlighted grass. Not our highest highlight, but definitely more highlighted. And we're going to find areas that we're going to define by light and value. Again, you could use an angle brush, you can use a round. I find sometimes the angle brushes give me sharper lines. It just depends on what you want in that moment. Maybe I'll say there's a little bit here that's uh, peeked into some light and then some forward facing little moments. you can see I keep these going, you know, different directions and I don't make them be orderly. Some are long, some are short. Just be here. You're okay. You're doing all right. And there we go. It's a nice little layer there, but you need another. A little of your yellow and green, it can help to have some white in it. The coverage, as we saw, also gives us that sense of things being really in the light.
Here we go. Pulling those through. Enjoying those deeply. Enjoy. Have fun. Be happy. Always come back with darker color. You can always add value and depth. Nice to take some highlights, I think, off the page so that it feels like the grass comes from somewhere. You want it to feel like it is coming from somewhere. Maybe get a little more white into it because I know I need a very light value here for this to show. Different values of grass. That's looking quite nice. Come back in, get some of your dark value. Put that in a few places. Anywhere you think it needs a sense of flow. Come back with light. Fill the layers. This meadow, magic enough to be full of life. Full. There we go. Now it's a good idea to change your water before we do the flowers and the butterflies. For the flowers, you have an unlimited opportunity for color. I mean, you pick what makes your heart happy. Uh, we showed some alternative colors you could use if you're having trouble getting a great pink. You know, you can just buy the pink or you can buy the purple that you like. I'm going to show you with dioxazine purple, phthalo blue, quinacridone magenta and cad red and fluid white how i do the flowers but again this is what i'm doing if it isn't perfect for you you make the change so i'm gonna start out mixing a little of my white into my purple and you can see with true dioxazine purple it's a very dark color so highlights take a uh, kind of a minute to come through and it can take more white than you might expect to get into the light lilacs and softer purples that you might be wanting. I'm going to just touch the brush and in some of these little clusters, weave the petals or flowers in through the downward branch. Just pulling those through. Sometimes my purple is darker. Sometimes it's lighter because in flowers, you know, their petals catch the light. Elements of them might change how something shows. But perhaps between these two, I can make a little cluster of just dropping flowers which i will start with a darker value and then highlight up it's very similar to how i did all my branches just a smaller brush and a more delicate touch
just continue through. It's kind of a repetitive process, which can be good if you're trying to lower your blood pressure. Sometimes in art, things that you do in repeated patterns are actually really good for you mentally and spiritually. Don't feel the need to rush through your art. I may move this piece down just to improve my uh, proximity to it. And I think it's nice to include little pops of the color through the tree, even if you are focusing on the blooms. Maybe they're ones that were starting or finishing, and it gives it that sense of Being there, you can always come through and add highlights to your clusters when they are dry enough to take the highlight. And you can see it is the contrast of those colors that helps the purple really show. Just work this through all of the branches where you want little clusters of flowers coming down. It is her crown, and it also symbolizes, you know, coming into that new spring. When we paint things that are blooming, it speaks to how we're feeling. Gardening is an act of optimism, putting blooms in your paintings you know, also an act of optimism. So it's not only good for you to look at, but it's good for you to create because it puts you in that state. You know, and that's an important thing. There's no limit to the number of little grape flow downs that you can have. You can have as many or as few as you want. They can be white, they can be yellow, they can be blue or pink or iridescent. It's all fine. Your tree. You know, if you're recovering from something in your health, Painting gardens uh, is very important. I did a little bit of work as uh, uh, with an agent that provides artwork to hospitals. And there's a lot of thinking put into the idea of the images that we look at and how they impact our healing. And gardens are very popular because they evoke a mental state of healing. So you can just create that in your own life, you know, your own mental state of healing. A little bit more light, you know, if you need to, to see it coming through. You know, sometimes things that look good for design aren't necessarily good for our psychology, too. And that's important to remember. Sometimes you should create the artwork that you need for your health and well-being. Now 
adding a little bit right here. You know, and when you have some different variants going through there, it's important to make sure that you have values that are different. So I like to come through and add, you know, highlights where necessary. Making a very light lavender. So even over my lighter lavender flowers, there's some highlights. And then we're going to get into our blue, and that's going to maybe even help it pop more. Just touch around and find those spots. And when you know you've really got that, come back and come through with a little bit of blue because the green bias of the phthalo blue really offsets the red, interestingly enough, of the dioxazine purple. You can come through here and they will play against each other and uh, I feel like even give you a little bit of that wisteria feeling. Blue is a very rare color in flowers so it's always noticeable when it comes up. Just play with it till it's just what you want. Okay. I think we're getting to a place where I'm happy. But you take this to where you're happy. Now we're going to do the butterflies and the flowers. I find I like to put the flowers in um, early. That way I can thoughtfully place the butterflies. Uh, a little known trick is if you take quinacridone magenta and cad red and mix them together, you get a very, very optically bright pink. And that can be really terrific when you're trying to make very noticeable little spike flowers like what we've got here. Well, they're not really spikes as much as the stem or structure of the flower is maybe not obvious to our eye. Sometimes flowers on such thin stems that um, it almost appears as if they're floating and we're trying to sort of duplicate That sense of things. Keep in mind that blooms might be forward in the grass or up high or cross over zones because they're part of a forward facing plant.
I'm just touching that along. And it's through the highlighting of this that we really get to see these flowers happen. Here at the grass near the lake, I might be lighter with them and then pull them from this back range of grass, maybe a little more aggressively. But I want the idea that there's little tiny spring flowers fully in bloom. Right here. Some of the dots are bigger, some are smaller. Try to vary it up, keep it interesting. Make sure that you've got layers. We're getting there. Now we're cooking with fire. Those are really wonderful and kind of bright, cheerful bits of flowers. They look like the kind of flowers that would call in the butterflies that we're seeing here. I'm going to get into my white. I'm going to make a very bright color. I might add a little more magenta into it, but I do want it to be light. And that's so that it really contrasts against what's there. Drop my brush. Just put this through all the flowers. Lots of little dots to do. We'll be here for a second, just dotting. I do want to keep it pink. That way the white of the butterflies is super noticeable in this space. That way we don't mistake the butterfly for little misshapen flowers.
just get the contrast going. Little dots, little flowers. You can see how we interweave them. And the value change help each color show. Okay, that's looking pretty good. The last little bit that we're going to do here is our butterflies. I feel like the butterflies add that layer of rebirth and transformation symbolically. I feel like they demonstrate the health and the vitality of the garden. So I think that they're important to add. But if you're not into butterflies, of course, you don't have to. I'm going to just use my fluid white and my number one detail brush. And the first butterfly I'm going to put is maybe right here on her leg. I do a little curve line. And come back and bring that in. And then it has a little partner that matches. The same shape of wing. And two little back wings. That's how I get that in there. That's a forward facing. And then uh, maybe right here, a little butterfly kind of to the side. So similar shape wing, a little back in, and then a hint of another wing. Here, we want someone kind of going the other way. And I'm going to put him right here because I want him to really show, and he needs to be over something dark to show. I think it's important to have some of them traveling different directions. If you make smaller shapes, then it will feel like there are smaller little butterflies or butterflies that are further away. So scale definitely plays a factor in this. And put little V's where I want to do tiny butterflies. And then uh, maybe a little kind of another one in front of the leg there. backwards flying one and the reason I like the butterflies to kind of cross in front of her is that it Creates a sense of, uh, you know, the space that she's in. You know, and sometimes the flies are bigger and sometimes they're smaller. just go where we need to go all right so if you've got a little chalk left you can always come back with a clean brush and that can be watercolor pencil or chalk and that that is why i like to use those tools you know can clean her up 
I really like to sign. You're not required to sign, but I like to sign uh, the things that I do. I'm going to get a little blue. Into my white hair. From right here. Just put a little signature on it. So we've signed and we finished and I just want to thank everybody for their time. I cannot wait to see your version in group. I will be constantly checking for your questions and to give encouragement. So feel free to ask, feel free to share. I really appreciate your time. I can't wait to see what you do. Be good to yourself, be good to each other. And I want to see you at a diesel real soon. Bye-bye.